My name is Robert Rob Price, and my wife's name was Alexandra Alex, never Sandy. I'm 5'10 inches and Alex is 5'6. I weigh about 190 pounds and stay in shape by running and working out at the gym twice a week. Alex's friends said I was a bit handsome. Alex weighs about 110 pounds and also goes to the gym. I have brown hair and blue eyes. Alex has blonde hair and brown eyes. We are both 34 years old, but Alex looks more like 28, although they tell me that I look my age. To me, Alex is the most beautiful woman in the world, and my whole world revolves around her and our two children, Samantha, 10, and Carl, 8. I have degrees in engineering and business management and work for a local company in our small town of less than 10,000 people. Alex was a nurse at our local hospital. Now she is a head nurse, earns good money, and no longer works shifts. I work in middle management and have been told that when the boss retires I will take over his position, so our future looks promising. We met at a party and immediately liked each other. We made love on our second date and got married six months later. Alex said she doesn't want children yet because she wants to travel and see the world. But things didn't go according to plan, and a few months later she became pregnant. It seems the pills aren't always reliable. Samantha was born eight months later, and Carl was born two years later. We decided that travel would have to be put on hold until the kids were off to college, but I noticed that Alex wasn't happy about the delay. To compensate, I tried to book trips abroad to give her a taste of what the future held. Throughout our marriage, we had the usual arguments, usually about money. Alex would say I didn't make enough money and I needed to get a job that paid better. I argued that my boss would retire soon and then I would get a promotion and money would no longer be an issue. Our biggest fight happened when she returned home in a brand new BMW X3, which she took on credit. I was furious and asked how we could afford this. She said that she had been promoted to department head and since it was her money, she decided to please herself. I should have understood then what would happen next, but I didn't. With hindsight, of course, everyone sees clearly. We didn't talk for a week, and she said I ruined her joy and kept me at a distance for a month. In the end, we made peace and agreed to discuss all major purchases in the future. Life went on. We were approaching our eleventh year of marriage and had been arguing a lot lately, as usual, about money and why it wasn't enough. I decided we needed to reconnect away from all the worries of home, so I booked a trip to the Bahamas for two weeks. I sold one of the rare stamps from my father's collection, which he left to me after his death. I didn't know how much they were worth, so I sent them in for an appraisal while we were away. When I told Alex about our trip, she was delighted and immediately began shopping for a new travel wardrobe. I still don't know where she found the money because she had her own account. On the day of departure, we took the children to her parents and drove to the airport, parking the car in the long-term parking lot. On the plane, she held my hand and told me how much she loved me and that I would be lucky that night. When we arrived at the hotel, we were quickly shown to our room. I couldn't afford a suite. It was only 11 am so we went for a walk to explore the area. We had a great view of the bay and could see the yacht dock. I have always liked boats, so I looked with interest at the moored yachts and those anchored nearby. Two of them were located about 200 yards from the shore. One was a sailing yacht that could be sailed alone thanks to new technology, the other was more like a small vessel that required a crew of several people. While walking, Alex spotted a restaurant on stilts overlooking the bay and said it would be fun to dine there someday. I agreed, and we continued to walk along the embankment looking into tourist shops and expensive boutiques. I was glad Alex didn't go into the boutiques, as that would have put a serious dent in our budget. We had lunch at a nice seafood restaurant and returned to the hotel. Alex wanted to take a shower and get dressed for dinner. When she came out of the shower, she looked incredibly sexy, but when I tried to seduce her, she said later. I also took a shower and changed clothes. We had dinner at the hotel restaurant then went to the bar where there was live music and a dance floor. The bar was full of tourists and everyone was having fun. When Alex was ready for bed, it was already after one in the morning, 
We went up to the room and Alex put on a sexy nightgown and got into bed. I went to the bathroom to brush my teeth, and when I came back she was fast asleep. I lay down next to him and also fell asleep. In the morning, when I woke up, Alex was already dressed and ready for breakfast. She hurried me to get dressed as quickly as possible. I was hoping for morning intimacy, but again to no avail, so I quickly showered, got dressed, and we went to breakfast. After breakfast we went on a tour with a local tour company. It was a wonderful day, and after lunch Alex decided to sunbathe by the pool. I don't like to sit still, so I went for a walk along the shore towards the yacht harbor and watched the boats come and go. This relaxed me, and I found a small cafe where I ordered coffee on the street. There I decided to surprise Alex and booked a table for dinner at that very restaurant on stilts. When I got back to the hotel, Alex was no longer at the pool, so I called her on her cell phone. She immediately answered and said that she was in the room and had prepared a surprise for me. I hurried to the room, hoping that I would finally get lucky, but when I opened the door, I saw her dressed and smiling. I tried not to show disappointment. Hello, dear. As a token of gratitude for this wonderful vacation, I have prepared a little surprise for you. She handed me a small brown envelope. When I opened it, there was an all-day fishing ticket for the coming Friday. I love fishing but didn't think much of it since this vacation was planned as an opportunity to reconnect. I thanked her, picked her up and kissed her on the lips, but she pulled away. Later, she said. Another disappointment. And now I'm surprised, I said. I booked us a table at a restaurant on stilts. She smiled and said, Today you will definitely be lucky. I was skeptical about her words, but did not pursue the topic. Since the restaurant looked quite fancy, we dressed up in our best clothes and headed out. When we arrived at the restaurant and approached the counter, I reported our reservation. The host called the head waiter, who came up to us. I explained that I had made a reservation for two this afternoon under the name Price. He flipped through the magazine and found our reservation, but said with regret, Unfortunately, your reservation was recently cancelled, and we have already given the table to others. He raised his hands in apology and added that there was nothing he could do and that he was very sorry. I looked at Alex and she looked like she wanted to collapse into the ground in shame. At that moment, a man approached us and asked the head waiter what the problem was. He explained the situation. While they were talking, I looked around the room. We were truly out of our element. The suits and dresses of the other guests would have cost me a month's salary. I looked closely at the man who was talking with the head waiter. He looked to be about 40 years old, was fit, and wore a perfectly tailored suit. He looked at us and said, it would be a shame if such a wonderful couple were turned away because of some stupid mistake. It would be my great pleasure if you would join me at the table. I tried to refuse, but he insisted, saying that he hated dining alone and that it would be a favor for him. I looked at Alex and saw that she wanted to accept his invitation, so I thanked him, and he asked the head waiter to prepare two seats for us. He helped Alex sit down, and the waiter handed over the menu. The man introduced himself as Jules Gaudier, and I introduced Alex and me. We sat down and I realized I had made a mistake when I saw the prices on the menu. Jules noticed my embarrassment and, correctly understanding the reason, put his hand on my shoulder, looked at Alex and quietly said, For your wife, please. And then he added louder, This is my gift as a token of gratitude for your company. Alex looked a little embarrassed but said nothing and dived into the menu. I felt uncomfortable and decided to order the cheapest dishes. Alex felt no remorse and ordered what she wanted. When I saw what she chose, I realized what a stroke of luck I had gotten away with her in tray cost over a hundred dollars. Throughout the dinner, Jules maintained a casual conversation involving me in it. We talked about everything, work, family, life goals. When asked what he did, he replied, nothing. Then he explained that he is a billionaire and spends his time traveling the world, visiting whatever places he wants at any moment. I saw Alex's eyes fill with dreaminess and heard her sigh of envy. We continued talking for another three hours, mostly about our goals in life. Alex, of course, said that she always wanted to travel and see the world, 
but the birth of Samantha and Carl stopped those plans. When she said this, she gave me a scathing look and then turned away. Jules, to his credit, pretended not to notice. As the evening drew to a close, Jules insisted that we have breakfast with him on his yacht, Lady Jane, and then head to a small island for snorkeling. Before I could say anything, Alex agreed, and our day tomorrow was planned. Jules said he would meet us at the pier at 7 m. We said goodbye, he went to his yacht, and we went to our hotel. When we returned to the hotel, I suggested we have a cocktail and dance a little. Alex said she was too tired and wanted to go to bed, so we went to the room. As soon as we entered the room, Alex began to reproach me. I've never been so embarrassed in my life, and you just stood there. If it weren't for Jules, we would have simply been sent away. Don't ever humiliate me like that again. Why can't you be like Jules and go after what you want instead of waiting until your boss retires? Jules gets whatever he wants. Now I'm going to bed and you can forget about your luck today, or even this week. Without waiting for an answer, she went into the shower and went to bed, turning her back to me. I lay in bed for several hours, thinking. This vacation was supposed to be an opportunity for a reunion, but everything went wrong. I began to think about our marriage. The more I thought, the more I came to the conclusion that everything was coming to an end. I could no longer tolerate her constant disrespect and nagging. If by the end of the vacation nothing changes, we will either have to go to a family psychologist or go to court. With this decision, I finally fell asleep. At 5.30 am we were woken up by a call from the reception, and at 7 am we were already at the pier. Jules was waiting for us and helped Alex into the small motorboat I followed. The boat took us to a large yacht, which I noticed on the first day. We approached a small pier, from where we went up the steps to the deck where a sailor met us and led us to a set table for three. Breakfast was light coffee, croissants, rolls, and butter. Jules said it was better to eat something light before swimming. After breakfast, we weighed anchor and went out to the open sea. We stopped in a small bay on one of the islands and dropped anchor again. Jules asked if I was diving, and I replied that I had not dived for a long time. He suggested I dive with one of the crew members so I wouldn't have to dive alone. I was delighted and asked Alex if she would mind. She replied that she didn't care what I did, she was going to sunbathe after swimming. Another example of disrespect, this time in front of a person we barely knew. Jules, as usual, pretended not to notice anything, although several crew members looked shocked. A crew member and I put on our gear and descended from the diving platform at the stern into the water. I noticed that Alex went swimming with Jules without saying goodbye to me. I spent half an hour exploring the reef and found some beautiful shells for Alex. I thought it would be a nice souvenir to take home. When I returned, took off my gear and changed into shorts and a t-shirt, Alex and Jules were sitting at a table on the beach that the crew had brought ashore. When I joined them, Alex looked like she had just won a competition and Jules seemed a little embarrassed. I briefly wondered what this meant, but quickly forgot when the crew served lunch. Fresh lobster, salad, and delicious white wine. After lunch, we discussed our swim and my dive. I went to get the shells to show them to Alex and solemnly placed them in front of her. I found them for you, thought you might like to bring them home. Jules interrupted me. Sorry, Rob, but these shells are protected. They need to be returned back to the water. Alex looked at me mockingly. You couldn't even do that right. You're useless. I was absolutely depressed and just walked to the other end of the beach. The walk back to our room was silent. The next day I woke up and Alex had already left. There was a note. She had gone shopping and would not return until tonight. There is no love, Alex, in fact, there is no signature at all. We barely spoke for the rest of the week, and she left every day until the evening. When I asked where she had been, she simply answered, walking. I noticed new items with designer tags and asked how much they cost. You didn't pay for them, so it's none of your business. From this conversation, I concluded that Jules had paid for them, and I got a bad feeling in my stomach. On Thursday, when I woke up, she was already out of the house again. I wondered if she had slipped me something because I usually don't sleep that long. 
That evening she returned later than usual, and my calls went straight to voicemail. I left her a message asking her to call me back, but she never responded. I waited for her, and when she finally came, it was already after midnight. Where have you been? I was worried about you. If you really need to know, I was with Jules all day. We went shopping and then had lunch. We had dinner on his yacht, then went to the club, and he just gave me a lift. By the way, do you like my new dress? Jules bought it for over a thousand dollars. At least he knows how to treat women. And before you ask, no, I didn't sleep with him. And now I'm tired and going to bed. If you want to talk, I'll see you when you get back from fishing. She showered and went to bed, but not before I told her something she might think about. If you think that I will tolerate this, you are very mistaken. When we get home, everything will change, or we won't be married anymore. Look, I'm sorry I offended you, but we'll talk tomorrow when you get back. The next morning I got up early and went fishing. It was a good day. I laughed and joked with the other fishermen. When we arrived back at the marina, I noticed that Jules' yacht had disappeared, and I thought, well, thank God. I went up to our room and opened the door. The first thing I noticed was that all of Alex's things that were usually on the dresser were gone. I looked into the wardrobe her clothes had also disappeared. She left. I sat on the bed, feeling sorry for myself and ready to cry. She had been acting like a real bitch for months now, but I still loved her. That's when I noticed two letters on my pillow. I took the one with her handwriting on it and opened it. Dear Rob, it shouldn't come as a surprise that I left. I've been unhappy for a long time. I know you tried, but I need more and you just can't give me what I need. Jules was a breath of fresh air for me. He did everything I dreamed of, and he invited me to join him on a yacht and travel the world. I just couldn't refuse this is what I've always dreamed of. He said we would travel first class and see all the places I had always wanted to see. Of course, this comes at a cost. So far I have not cheated on you, but this will most likely change this evening, and it will continue to be so. I don't love Jules, and he doesn't love me either. It's just a partnership of convenience. When I'm done, I intend to return to you and our children, and we can grow old together as we planned. Please don't judge me, I just need it. I look forward to seeing you in the future. With love, Alex. I sat there in shock. How could she be so naive? Growing old together? Not in this world. I opened the second letter. Dear Rob, Alex doesn't know I wrote this letter, but I thought it was worth explaining. I belong to a group of wealthy businessmen we call the Syndicate. Every year we choose a companion to join the circle who will warm our bed. As soon as I saw Alex, I knew she was perfect for our group, unsatisfied with her life and husband. I've been taking wives from their husbands for years, it's so easy. Every woman has her own price. Find what she wants most, give it to her, and she will follow you anywhere and do whatever you want. I hasten to add that Alex has not yet been unfaithful to you, but tonight she definitely will, or I will drop you off at the next stop. You're probably asking why I choose married women when I can get anyone. The answer is simple. I enjoy taking the wives of other men. I'll keep it for a year or two and then trade it for another with one of the club members. She should return to you in about four years, that's how long they usually last. When she returns, she will be a rich woman, we will make sure of that. All her patrons will generously give her gifts, and the latter will give her at least a million dollars. We don't keep women over 40 because they start to wear out at that age. Please don't try to find me because I sympathize with you and wouldn't want you to be punished. Your friend, Jules. I sat there, petrified, then began to tremble and finally burst into tears. I tried to repair my relationship with Alex and I got punched in the gut for my efforts to save our marriage. I lay there sobbing into my pillow until I fell asleep. The next morning I woke up early. I no longer felt sad, only intense anger. I called the airline and changed my flight to an earlier one. I packed my suitcase and checked out of the hotel. I had lunch at the airport, but everything seemed tasteless. What will I tell the children? That their mother is a woman of easy virtue who abandoned them for a better life with another man. 
everything was so confusing that I couldn't think clearly. When our plane landed, I picked up the car from the long-term parking lot and drove home. On the way, I stopped at the store for milk and microwave dinner I couldn't eat on board and was hungry. When I arrived at the house, the first thing I saw was Alex's car. I thought, this won't happen anymore. I went into the house, unpacked my things, cooked dinner, and poured myself a glass of wine. After eating, I looked around and noticed our wedding photo on the mantelpiece. I tried to remember the happy moments we had together, but I couldn't remember a single one. I realized that all the happy memories were clouded by the last terrible year I spent with her. As I sipped my wine, I thought about what I had decided to do if she didn't change her attitude I was going to get a divorce. I started laughing and couldn't stop. She did it for me. If I filed for divorce, she would get half of everything, plus the house and children. I would be obligated to pay her child support. I am lucky, everything now belongs to me, all that remains is to agree on how to deal with the children. I went to bed in a much better mood, but still wanted to take revenge on Jules, at least a little. Well, what will be will be. On Sunday morning, there was little I could do except cancel Alex's credit card and transfer all of our savings and joint account into my checking account. If she needs money, she has her personal account, or she can ask her boyfriend. I waited at home until the evening, so that when the children were already in bed, I could go to my in-laws. On the way, I was afraid of what I would have to tell them. Mike and Linda were like parents to me, and they always said that I was the son they never had. I stopped in front of their house and went to the door. Mike opened it. Rob, we didn't expect to see you until next week. Did something happen? Where's Alex? He asked, looking around. Linda came into the living room. Where is Alex, Rob? Is she okay? Seeing their worried faces, I could not stand it and burst into tears, not because of my lost wife, but because of their lost daughter, telling them everything. Linda sat next to me and hugged me, and Mike stood behind me and put his hand on my shoulder, squeezing it gently. When I came to my senses a little, I showed them the letters. After reading them, Linda sat crying, and Mike paced the room, looking as angry as I've ever seen him. Finally, he spoke. Rob. I'm sorry Alex did this to you. You know, we have always considered you our son. Now we don't have a daughter, we lost her, but we will always have a son. He hugged me, hugged me tightly, Linda came over and hugged us both. Rob, I agree with Mike, you are now our only child. You and our grandchildren are all that remains of our family. Please don't move away from us. You are always a welcome guest here and can stay as long as you want. When we parted ways, Mike made coffee, and we discussed how to tell the kids everything the next day. The next morning, when the kids came down for breakfast and saw me sitting with a cup of coffee, they immediately ran into my arms. I could hardly hold back my tears. Samantha looked around and looked at me. Pap, where's mom? Sit down, I need to tell you something. I sat on one side of the kitchen table, Mike and Linda sat on the other, and the kids were on their laps. This will be very difficult for you, but first I want you to know that we all, including your mother, love you very much. I wasn't sure about their mother, but what else could I say? You know that mom always wanted to travel and see the world. She met a friend on our vacation, and he offered her the opportunity to make it happen. Mom went with him and will be gone for a while. But don't worry, your grandparents will help you, take you to school and pick you up from there. I'll try to change my work hours to spend more time with you, so things won't change that much for you. I paused to gauge their reaction and was amazed by Samantha's response. So, Dad, you want to say that she left us and left with another man? So, huh? Her words shocked us all. She continued. Well, one thing will definitely change. We won't have to tiptoe around anymore when she's around. We won't miss her. Never underestimate the insight of a ten-year-old girl. We all sat there, stunned by her reaction, and it was as if we were seeing Samantha suddenly eight years older. Well, shall we have breakfast or what? We need to go to school, she added, completely calmly. I looked at Carl. He clearly didn't fully understand what was happening, but, apparently, he took his sister's example 
and was ready to follow her mood. While Linda was preparing breakfast and helping the kids get ready for school, Mike came up to me. Well, it went better than I expected. Was she really that difficult to communicate with? For me, yes, but I didn't know it had such an impact on the children. However, things could have been worse. Mike said he would take the kids to school and pick them up later so I could go to work and take care of business. When I arrived at work, I decided to go straight to the boss, but his secretary Sarah said that he was not there and suggested that I go see Mr. Jamson, our general director. When I arrived at his office, his assistant immediately escorted me inside. Ah, uh, Rob, I didn't think you'd be back earlier. Why did you arrive so early? Well, Mr. Jamson, stop. When we're alone, call me Phil, he said. So, what happened? I told him about the situation. He said how much he regretted it, but then noted that there was a bright side. While I was on vacation, my boss suffered a minor heart attack and won't be returning to work anytime soon, so I've been assigned his duties indefinitely. This meant that I would no longer have to travel to clients to resolve problems and would also receive the same salary as my boss until he returned. He also suggested that I take the rest of the week to sort out my financial and personal matters. This was great news now I could spend more time with my children and be flexible with my schedule. I then went to HR and removed Alex from the insured list, making the children my primary heirs and immediate family members. I then made an appointment with my lawyer for the next day. My lawyer was an old friend from college, James Slack, who specialized in family law and also handled my day-to-day -day legal affairs. He greeted me cordially and offered me coffee. As we sat down to drink it, he started talking. So, Rob, I guess this is more than just a friendly meeting. What's on your mind? I explained what happened and gave him the letters. Okay, let's figure it out. You took Alex on vacation to improve your relationship, and she left you for a billionaire and just moved away. Is everything right? I confirmed. I assume you want a divorce? The sooner the better, I replied. Sorry, Rob, but I can't. All I can do is file for immediate legal separation. This way you will no longer be responsible for her debts. If she returns within a year, you can serve her with notice. Otherwise, you will have to wait a year and divorce her for leaving the family. I assume you want sole custody of the children. There is absolutely no way she will have children, I said bitterly. Hey, take it easy, tiger. This shouldn't be a problem. Her letter to you proves that she doesn't care about their well-being. I'll serve that, too. By the end of the week, you will break all ties with her. How did her parents take it? They disowned her and accepted me into their family, I said with a slight chuckle. Rob, you seem to be taking this pretty calmly. Are you sure you want to go that fast? James, to be honest, the divorce has been brewing for a year. This vacation was my last attempt to save our marriage, and we both know how it turned out. Okay, if you are sure, I will submit the documents as soon as they are ready. I will publish a notice in local and several national newspapers that you are no longer responsible for her debts. On your way out, go see Joy, she's a secretary and a notary. She'll give you a list of financial issues that need to be resolved. Say hi to Helen, to your wife, and give the kids a hug for me. Oh damn, didn't think about Helen. You do understand that she will be waiting for you for dinner every time she finds you a new date? He laughed. Tell her that I'm not ready yet, let her wait until my divorce, and then she can set me up with anyone, as long as she cooks dinner. She's the best cook I know. When I got home, I looked at the list Joy gave me and realized that I had already completed all the items except one. I called the finance company where Alex took out a loan to buy her car and told them that they had better take it now because there would be no money to pay the dues. I also told them to contact my lawyer for more information. I looked at my watch and realized that Mike would soon pick up the kids from school. Where did all the day go? Mike brought the children half an hour later and left. I still hadn't bought any groceries, so I took the kids to McDonald's and warned them that this would not become a regular practice. When we got home, we watched the Frozen DVD together, but what else? And then the children went to bed. I kissed them goodnight 
Carl said, oh dad, and Samantha said, I love you. Then I went downstairs, took a beer from the refrigerator, turned on some soft jazz music, and sat down to sip my beer. Suddenly I realized that I felt much calmer than I had in a long time. I even raised a toast to Jules for taking Alex away. What a great way to get rid of a bitchy wife. Alex. The trouble started when Rob made a reservation at a restaurant on stilts. When we were almost turned around, I was embarrassed to the core and more angry than ever. Then Jules came to our rescue. He was everything that Rob was not. Sophisticated, charming, and of course, very rich. I was immediately drawn to him and wished that he was my husband instead of my socially awkward spouse. When we got on his yacht, I was literally drooling, and when Rob went diving and I stayed with Jules, I made my move. I put on the skimpiest swimsuit I bought especially for Rob and thought, screw Rob, I'll seduce Jules. But my efforts were in vain. Jules did not react at all. I had almost given up when he suggested we have lunch on the beach. The crew served a full-service lunch, including table and chairs. Just as we were starting to get served, Rob joined us. When he showed me the shells he had found for me, acting like a winner, and Jules humiliating him, I finally exploded and attacked Rob. He walked off down the beach in frustration, and that's when Jules made his move. Alex, I can't help but notice that you and Rob are having problems in your marriage. Do I understand correctly that it's about money? It's not just about money, but also about his attitude to life. He has no ambition and is content to just sit at his desk, waiting for the promotion that may come. We were going to travel and see the world, but I got pregnant and that all evaporated. I hate my life. It's so boring. I go to work, come home to two fighting children and a boring husband. There is no excitement, just one boring day followed by another. Sorry, you probably don't want to hear about my problems. How long will you stay in Miami? Please don't worry about telling me about your problems. Actually, I may have a solution. And which one? Alex, if you had the opportunity to travel around the world in first-class comfort, but to do this you had to leave your family and sleep with another man for a year or more, would you agree? Don't answer me now, think about it. Tomorrow I'm going shopping and I want you to keep me company, just you, without any obligations. Of course, I happily agreed to his proposal, although I already knew what my answer would be, but I didn't want to seem too approachable. That night I gave Rob one of my sleeping pills to help him sleep. I spent the entire next day with Jules, enjoying the luxury. We went shopping, he spent a fortune on me, then we went clubbing. On Thursday, when I returned from the club, I told Rob that we would talk when he returned from fishing the next day. Rob got up early and went fishing, and I immediately called Jules and asked him to help me with my luggage. I sat down and wrote Rob a goodbye letter, and when Jules arrived, I took my things out into the taxi. When we got to his yacht and set sail, I thought about how Rob would open my letter and how upset he would be. I started to feel guilty but I reminded myself of all the wonderful places I had to see and the guilt disappeared. When we left the dock, we were sitting on the lower deck and Jules asked for my wallet. I held it out, not understanding why he needed it. He turned it upside down, went through the contents and took out my wallet. He took out his credit card, debit card and passport, then threw the cards overboard, saying, You don't need them anymore, but I'll keep this, he said, pointing to the passport. I was stunned he had just basically erased my old life. Now I was completely dependent on Jules for everything. I have always been an independent woman, but that changed in an instant. As I watched the shore disappear into the horizon, I wondered what I had gotten myself into. I was soon to find out. We were served dinner and one of the crew served us. I don't remember exactly what we ate, but I remember that the wine was the best I've ever tasted. It was time to go to bed, and I began to wonder how the sleeping arrangements would be organized. Jules called one of the crew members. Show Mrs. Price to her cabin. I'm sure she wants to shower and change. I thought this was the answer to my question, but how wrong I was. Alex, I made sure to buy you a new wardrobe. Your old clothes were thrown away earlier. I hope you enjoy my selection, especially the lingerie and nightgowns. 
I'm waiting for you to choose one for tonight, but for now I have things to do, so see you later. He made it clear that he expected me to spend the night with him without even kissing me. When I entered my cabin, I saw my suitcases in the corner, but they were empty. I opened the cabinets to see what he bought for me. The clothes were all from top brands and fit perfectly. The underwear and nightgowns looked like they were meant for a honeymoon. I've never worn anything this revealing, not even for Rob, let alone a near stranger. I chose a sheer set feeling as nervous as a bride on her wedding night. I thought about emailing the kids to explain something, but my laptop wasn't in the cabin. There were several books on the shelf, and I started reading one of them at random. A couple of hours later, there was a knock on the door, and Jules entered without waiting for an answer. He said how gorgeous I looked in my outfit. He came up to me and took my hand. Alex, you look stressed. Surely you knew what to expect, there are no free lunches. Now take off this outfit and let me look at my trophy. I did as he said and turned in front of him so he could look at me. Very good, now undress me and make it memorable. I thought he would stay the night, but he left soon after. I lay there, feeling used and abandoned. The sex was good, but no better than with Rob, and I missed the intimacy of cuddling afterwards but it was all part of what I signed up for, and now I had to live with it. I thought idly about my husband and children, whom I might never see again, and then the tears began to flow. Jules kept his promise. We visited all the islands, dined in the best restaurants, and went shopping in the most expensive boutiques. Jules bought me expensive jewelry and clothes and showed me all the sights. When we left the last island, Jules said that we would head to Europe before the weather turned bad. He said we would dock in the UK and go to London for a party. We had sex almost every night, but it was just a repeat of our first time. We docked in Liverpool and went on excursions like ordinary tourists. We then headed to London and docked at St. Catherine's Pier. Jules showed me all the main sights in London, and I was delighted to see everything I had dreamed of. Alex. I want you to look especially sexy tonight. We're going to a party and you'll meet other men like me and their dates like you. I wore an emerald silk dress with a thigh-high slit and rubies that Jules gave me. I looked in the mirror and thought, yes, I would sleep with myself, and immediately blushed, realizing what that meant. The Rolls Royce picked us up from the dock and took us to a very exclusive club. The syndicate, as I was later told, is what we belonged to, rented the entire club for the night. When we entered, there were about twenty men, each with a beautiful woman. Everyone sat on the edges, leaving the dance floor in the center. Many men waved to Jules, and some women too. A smooth jazz band was playing and several couples were slow dancing. While I was watching, one of the men began to act very openly towards his partner. I was shocked to see how the dancing couple allowed themselves to open up in public. Jules led us into a booth, and we sat down opposite a man of about fifty who was with a woman no older than me. As I looked around, many couples were doing similar things, and I began to wonder if I would have to do the same. Jules looked at me strangely, as if trying to gauge my reaction to all this depraved behavior. When Jade, as I later learned her name, returned, we met. Jade's partner, Charles, was a very wealthy stockbroker, and their arrangement was similar to ours. Jules and Charles went off to talk to other men at another table, and Jade spoke to me. So, Alex, how long have you been in the circle? I don't understand. What circle are you talking about? Oh, then you must be new. Let me explain. Tell me if I'm wrong, but I bet you were on holiday with your husband and Jules just happened to befriend you both, right? How do you know? This is his style. He finds a middle-class couple with a beautiful wife and focuses his attention on her. He manages to separate them and then charms his wife, offering her everything that she can never have with her husband. He takes her to the most expensive restaurants and boutiques, essentially buying her from her unsuspecting husband. Don't get me wrong, he will give you everything he promised and more, but it will come at a cost. Now you belong to him. You no longer make decisions about what happens to you so just go with the flow. How old are you, 34 or 35? 
they don't keep you in the syndicate for more than forty years, by which time you will become rich by our standards. The only condition for a man to join the syndicate is that he must have a net worth of more than a billion dollars. Women should be married and beautiful. For them, taking a wife from her husband is a trophy, and every time they have sex with you, they think about your cuckold. You can't change your mind, you don't have access to money, they take care of that, and they hold your passport so you can't escape. Do you see how they talk there? They are discussing who to swap with whom. You see, they exchange companions so that sex doesn't get boring. One day Jules will exchange you for another wife, and you will have a new master. Yes, I said master, because we are nothing more than women of easy virtue, well paid, but still women of easy virtue. Sometimes, perhaps even tonight, the meeting turns into a party, and you are expected to sleep with anyone who asks. Sometimes you may be given to servants as a reward for some service to your master. Never complain, and you will be rewarded. I've been in the syndicate for two years now, and I've had three masters. I have over a million dollars worth of jewelry and a house in Chelsea with a Porsche in the garage. I'm 38 years old, so I still have time to double this. I was also told that the last owner I would have would give me a generous check when I was abandoned. The price for this is that you and I will never have our own family, no grandchildren, and we will probably end our lives alone. So enjoy it. Sex is great now, but over time it gets boring. For example, Tonight you saw me pretending to stroke his ego. Charles is a good guy and treats me well, and thank God he doesn't like weird stuff like some of them do. Look, they're coming back. If they ask, I'll tell you how wonderful everything is here. That night, the meeting actually turned into what Jade said it would be, and after being drugged, I slept with about 20 men and one woman. The next morning I woke up alone in my bed and thought, what have I done? I went down for breakfast, but it turned out that lunch was already being served. It was almost 13.30. I waited for Jules to come, but instead, a young man of Middle Eastern appearance sat opposite me and introduced himself as Prince Osman, but everyone called him Aussie. He said I was traded, and now I belong to him. He didn't have a yacht, but his private jet was no less luxurious. He was particularly interested in my past life, and wanted to know about my intimate life with Rob. I realized that he wanted me to compare him to Rob in his favor, so I downplayed Rob by saying that Aussie was a much better lover, which seemed to satisfy his ego. Over the next seven months, he took me to Egypt and showed me all the wonders of that country. Thanks to his wealth and status, we were even allowed to enter the pyramids. We traveled almost all the time and attended parties twice more with other members of the syndicate, but, fortunately, without sex. This was the second time I saw Paris, the first time was with Jules. When I first saw the Eiffel Tower, I was delighted, the same with the Louvre, but as they say, once is enough. The novelty wore off, but I still enjoyed the restaurants and shopping. Two years later, it all became boring, the high-class life was boring, but I grew rich by choosing the most expensive jewelry and clothes I could find, I was already with the fourth owner, the Greek ship owner Alexander, irony of fate. One evening, to his horror, he loaned me to his bodyguard for the night. Unlike Alexander, he was rude. He had terrible breath and body odor. After he left, I showered for over an hour, but still felt dirty. But he bought me a house by the sea in Malibu. At the beginning of the fourth year, I learned from one of the girls that Jules left the syndicate circle for health reasons. I smiled he was the bastard who seduced me in the first place, although, come to think of it, it was more my fault. Sex has now become boring. Now I was eager to get as much as possible from my master, because I would soon turn thirty-nine, and I was waiting to be thrown away. I even began to look forward to this moment such a life no longer attracted me, I often fell asleep in tears, thinking about Rob and the children. Samantha was about to become a young woman, and I wouldn't be there to guide her. I regretted what I did every day and what I had to pay for it. When I turned 39, I was traded again, this time to Charles, an English stockbroker I met at my first party. Jade told me about his preferences and how he was very generous. I spent the next eight months with him. 
I was four months away from turning 40, so it was no surprise that one day he said it was time to leave the syndicate. To say I was relieved would be an understatement, although my time with him was pleasant and not too demanding. We were in his penthouse in London when he told me the news. He said I could stay there until my affairs were settled and gave me a parting gift. It was a numbered account in Switzerland. He also said that at my house in Malibu there was a surprise waiting for me in the garage. He said that all my owners, yes, he did say owners, had deposited money into this account, and now I was worth over $6 million. He said I should see an investment advisor to get the most out of my money. He then said that all my other things, jewelry, etc., were in storage in Malibu and gave me the address and password. He gave me back my driving license and passport and also gave me a British bank debit card. He said I might need some cash and handed over £5,000 in cash, adding that there was another £50,000 in the account. Then he kissed me on the cheek and left. That's it, I was free to continue my life. I explored London as a free woman and visited all the places I had not seen before. At first it was strange to be alone, but then I felt that being free was good. I booked tickets to Malibu and packed two suitcases. I boarded my flight first class, of course, and prepared to return home. Rob. I went to bed early that night. It had been a busy day, and the fatigue had accumulated over the past week. I woke up rested and happy. Everything was starting to come together, and life seemed wonderful. I fed the children and took them to school. They didn't seem to miss their mother at all. I decided to talk to their director about our new situation and made an appointment for that same day. When I arrived at the appointed time, I was immediately shown inside. I explained the situation, and the director's face showed shock. I asked if the children should see a psychologist. Normally I would say yes, but let's wait until they get used to the idea and see how it affects their grades or behavior. For now, I will let their teachers know about your situation, and they will keep an eye on them. I left feeling much more relaxed, knowing that the children would be looked after by professionals. It's been six months since Alex left, and it couldn't have been better. The children's grades even improved and teachers were pleased with their progress. My promotion became official because my boss took early retirement. As James predicted, Helen invited me to several dinners and introduced me to several single women. However, I was not ready for a new relationship and did not contact any of them, although I enjoyed Helen's dishes. James said she wouldn't give up until I was happily married again. I replied that I was looking forward to her culinary masterpieces, but I would not date until I got a divorce. Alex never tried to contact me, the kids, or our friends, as if she no longer existed. One day I was sorting out papers and came across a package received with a delivery notification. At first I didn't remember when I received it, but when I opened it, I remembered. It arrived when I just returned home. It was a stamp album that I left for appraisal before we went on vacation. When I read the letter attached to the parcel, my pulse quickened it turned out that the collection contained very valuable stamps. My father left it to me after his death along with an estimate of its value for inheritance. I sent her to a reputable auction house with a request to sell as many stamps as needed to pay for our vacation. They sold only one stamp, it was enough to cover all expenses, and the rest turned out to be worth their weight in gold. The appraiser wanted me to contact him to discuss the sale of the remaining stamps. I made an appointment for the following week and tried to estimate their cost online. I was stunned to learn that one of the British stamps was extremely rare, and one of these was sold at Sotheby's in England for over a million pounds. Of course, I realized that mine probably wasn't worth that much it was probably a fake. I left the children with their grandparents and went to New York for a meeting. I was accepted immediately and the appraiser shook my hand. Well, Mr. Price, we finally met. I must say that your collection has aroused great interest. You have some very rare stamps, some of which were considered non-existent. We thought all the black pennies were accounted for, and to find two stamps that remained stuck together was incredible. Of course, we thought they were fake at first, but after two experts confirmed their authenticity, we were very excited. In short, 
we would like to auction the entire collection at our London branch. We will first have to figure out whether it would be better to sell them individually or as a collection. But why in England? I asked. If you sell them in the US, you will lose a significant amount in taxes. However, if you sell them in England and deposit the money into a numbered account abroad, NOAS tax will apply. As long as you keep your money outside the US, there are no taxes. I can't say anything more because I'm already walking on thin ice, but if you contact this person, he will help you. He gave me a business card that said, Financial Advisor. When you're ready to sell, contact me and I'll get the process started. I paid for his services, which was not cheap and left, promising to contact him later. I actually contacted him. His name was Guy. He listened to my story. Okay, you're divorced, and you have a stamp collection that's worth millions, and you want to hide the proceeds, right? About like this. What can you do for me? It's actually easier than you think. When you receive the check, you will deposit it into a numbered account, for example in Serbia. The money will then be transferred to several other banks in the Eastern Bloc countries, and from there to a numbered account in the Cayman Islands. You can then withdraw amounts under £9,000 to a Western bank several times a year. You will receive a visa card that can be used all over the world, and you will live on this money. For large purchases, you can use a bank transfer through a third party or an offshore account. Just call me when you're ready, and I'll arrange everything. Questions? What if I need cash? No problem. Withdraw as usual via Visa card. You can even open an account at a local bank and transfer money there as long as the amount does not exceed 9000 no one will pay attention to it. I walked out feeling like a trader hiding his money, but that was essentially what I was going to do. A year passed, and I divorced Alex for leaving the family. Three months later, I was free. Helen threw a party for my divorce. This time she invited several single women at once. She told me to pick one and at least start dating her to remind myself what I was missing out on. I had been celibate for over a year and was already looking forward to getting back into the dating world. The party was informal, so slacks and an untucked shirt were appropriate attire. Of course, informal style for women meant better dresses and makeup you can't win with women. The party was a great success, as you'd expect with Helen doing the catering. Some of the women she invited were divorced, and some were simply lonely. A couple of them showed interest in me, but none of them attracted me. Midway through the evening, Helen introduced me to her cousin Carol. I felt an instant attraction, and something slipped between us. She was about five feet seven inches tall, with long red hair, weighed about 110 pounds, with green eyes and a face like a mischievous elf. She later told me that she works as a realtor for a local company. We hit it off immediately and spent the rest of the evening talking and dancing. She several times refused other men who asked her to dance, gently rejecting them. At the end of the evening, we were the last to leave. I was a little drunk, but she was sober because she didn't drink, because she had to drive the car. She offered to give me a ride home, and I gratefully accepted. When we said goodbye, Helen had a pleased grin on her face, and James gave her a thumbs up and a wink. Carol noticed all this, and I apologized to my friends. Carol found this extremely funny and told me about it. When we arrived at my house, I got out of the car, thanked her, and got ready to go inside. Will you at least invite me for a glass of something before bed? She said, already getting out of the car and heading towards the front door. I stood there stunned until she took my arm and pulled me towards the door. I opened the door with shaking hands, let us inside and turned on the light. Carol stood in the center of the room, looking around. For a man with two children, your house is very clean, I'm impressed. Then she walked into the kitchen as if she had lived here all her life. I followed her like a lost puppy. Before I could explain anything to her, she had already opened the cabinets, found two mugs and cocoa, and put on the kettle. I sat down at the kitchen table, not understanding what was happening. She leaned against the countertop and looked into my eyes. I'm not usually that assertive, but Helen said that if I don't I'll show initiative, you just wish me good night and I will never hear from you again. I understand that you are wary now after your previous relationship, 
but I'm not like your ex, and I want to try to start a relationship if you want to. So, I looked into her eyes and saw her fear of rejection and wondered why. I would really like this, but I was afraid that you would consider me a pathetic option. What I don't understand is why such a beautiful woman would want to date a man with two kids and a lot of problems. Firstly, I love children, and secondly, I also have my own problems, because of which I never got married. And here's why, if you're interested. I was once taken advantage of without my consent, I became pregnant, but the child died at birth, and I forever lost the opportunity to become a mother. So if you want more children, we better say goodbye right now. Before I knew what I was doing, I was standing and hugging her. I'm so sorry, I didn't know. And in answer to your question, no, I don't want more children, two are enough. At that moment, the kettle boiled and Carol prepared the drinks. I took my mug and went to sit at the table. Oh no, you won't leave so easily, mister. We have a sofa in the other room, let's go there. I sat down on the sofa and she sat next to me, placing the mugs on the coffee table. Then she snuggled up to me, resting her head on my shoulder and looked at me with tears shining in her eyes. We sat there for a few seconds, just looking at each other. Well, are you going to kiss me or not? I didn't need to be told twice. There was no sex, and after about an hour, she said it was time to leave. I walked her to the car and watched her drive away, thinking, it's time to move on. After that night, we started seeing each other about once every two weeks. Dinner, dancing, sometimes a movie. About three months later, we were sitting on my couch when she asked, Do you find me attractive? I think you are one of the most beautiful women I have ever seen. Why are you asking? We've been dating for three months, and you still haven't asked me to bed. What's wrong with me? In response to her question, I took her hand and led her to the bedroom. We were naked in record time. While I was in the bathroom, she must have woken up, because when I returned, she looked at me and said, your wife gave it up for another man. She was definitely crazy. After what you gave me, I will never let you go. I climbed back into bed, and we cuddled, and then fell asleep. The next morning was Saturday, so none of us had to go to work. Carol made coffee and toast before saying she needed to go home to change, and can we meet later? I said I needed to pick up the kids. I also said that it was time for her to meet them, and that I should talk to Alex's parents about me having a new woman. When I arrived at Mike and Linda's, I was as nervous as a cat caught in a crowd of swaying chairs. The kids were playing in the backyard, and I asked Mike and Linda to talk. You know how much I love you, you are like my parents, but you are also Alex's parents. I've been hiding something from you for the last three months. I need you to know that I am dating a woman, and it is getting serious. I didn't know what to expect, but they looked at each other and then pulled me into a three-way hug. Rob, we are so happy for you. It's time to leave Alex in the past and move on. When can we meet our future daughter-in-law? Wait, we haven't gotten that far yet, but it's serious. Linda spoke. Rob, you're going to have to tell the kids and where to do it if not here. Bring her to Sunday lunch to introduce her to the children and her future in-laws and don't even try to say no, we insist and can't wait to meet her. I told Carol that she would have to meet my entire family at once, but instead of being afraid, she seemed excited. We arrived at Mike and Linda's around noon and were greeted at the door by happy faces and my children. As soon as we entered, the children ran up to me and almost knocked me down. Mike and Linda hugged Carol and told her that she would always be welcome in their home. I introduced Carol to the children as my special friend. Samantha said, You mean like your girlfriend? Well, she really is a girl, and she's my friend, so I guess you're right. Dad, I'm already twelve, not five. I understand the difference. She's definitely your girlfriend, not just a friend who's also a girlfriend. I stood there, not knowing how to respond, until Carol walked up to Samantha and they high-fived each other. Carol looked at me with a smug smile, as if to say, Well, now try to refute this. Mike and Linda could hardly contain their laughter when Carl interrupted. Does this mean you will be our new mother? 
I almost fainted at his words and looked at Carol in shock, but she just laughed and said, Well, answer him and let's put everyone out of their misery. I looked around for inspiration, but found nothing. I took a sip and replied, Well, this place is open if she wants to take it. I looked at Carol and she replied, If this is a proposal, then yes, and by the way, you've been working towards this for a long time. You don't have a ring, I suppose. Linda chimed in. Wait a minute. She went upstairs and Mike was smiling so hard his face must have hurt. When Linda returned, she handed me the box with the ring and whispered that it was her grandmother's ring. Now, young man, do it properly. I got down on one knee and said, Carol, will you do me the honor of becoming my wife? And I opened the box with the ring. Yes, and a thousand times more yes. We hugged and kissed until Mike cleared his throat. Well, now that that's settled, how about lunch? Carol looked at the ring on her finger and smiled when Linda said it was temporary until she found something she liked. Carol looked at her in surprise. This is the perfect ring. I love it already. Can I leave it? Linda replied, Of course, dear, if you really like it. I offered it to Alex, but she wanted something new. I'm so glad you like it. You are now officially a member of our family. We now have not only a son, but also a daughter. The children quickly became attached to Carol like a fish to water, and it was difficult for me to attract her attention. We sat down to lunch and Carol helped clear the table while Mike and I sat on the porch with beers. Son, she seems like a good girl. Linda and I are so happy for you and the kids. Tell me about her. And I told him everything from our first meeting to today. When I returned inside, Carol was nowhere to be found. When my mother saw me looking for her, she told me to look in Carl's room. I got up and found them all playing on his Xbox. Samantha cheered Carol on as she and Carl raced around the virtual landscape. I decided not to interrupt them while they worked things out and went back downstairs. Mom came up to me. Son, I think you will succeed. The kids already adore her, and so do we. She hugged me and left. I came here with the excitement of meeting the family, and they took everything into their own hands. I came in as a single father and left engaged to a beautiful woman. My life changed in a matter of hours, and I was still trying to catch up with events. Carol insisted that I take her home so that I could discuss what had happened with the children. When we got home, it was almost time to put them to bed, so I told them to get ready for bed, and then we'd talk. So, what do you guys think of Carol? I want to hear the truth, even if it hurts me. Samantha replied, Dad, I really like her. She looks more like an older sister than an expectant mother. She said she was going to take me shopping for new things on Saturday. It sounds fun, but remember, don't take advantage of her generosity, okay? Carl added, Dad, she's awesome. She even beat me at my own game of Mario. When is she moving in with us? Take your time, Tiger. We are not married yet. Oh, Dad, be realistic. We're not stupid, you know. We see this all the time at school. Divorced parents live with their boyfriends or girlfriends. Samantha said this, rolling her eyes, and Carl covered his mouth, trying not to laugh. Well, I was put in my place. I thought it was time for them to have a mother who would keep order and instill in them family values. I managed with Carl, but with Samantha everything was much more difficult. She needed constant female influence. Even after Samantha's comment, Carol never stayed overnight if the children were at home. It didn't seem right. Six months later, we got married. It was a small ceremony with our small family and a few close friends. Mike drove us to the airport for our honeymoon in London. The reason we chose London was simple. Firstly, we wanted to enjoy the English atmosphere, and secondly, on the third day of our stay, there was going to be a stamp auction. Yes, I planned all this with Carol's approval. Another thing worth mentioning, when I told Carol about the stamps, she insisted on a prenuptial agreement. She didn't want me to worry about leaving me without anything. God, how I love this woman. Our honeymoon was wonderful. We saw all the sights and visited all the must-see places. 
Carol especially liked the world of Harry Potter and the Tower of London. The auction took place during the second week of our honeymoon, and I met Guy. He stood up as I entered, and we shook hands. So, Mr. Price, what is it like to be rich? I don't know yet. I didn't even find out how much they were sold for. He looked at me as if I had come from another planet, and with his mouth open, he collapsed back into his chair. Oh my God, are you serious? My clients usually know how much they have earned down to the last penny. You really don't know. No, I don't have the slightest idea. Why don't you enlighten me? Fine. They were sold separately, and after all expenses, including mine, you are now worth over 9 million British pounds, which is equivalent to about 11 and a half million US dollars. Now it was my turn to fall into the chair with my mouth open. I couldn't wrap my head around that amount of money. The children were provided for for life, and any financial problems were a thing of the past. I started laughing. What's so funny? I just thought that if Alex had waited, she could have had everything she wanted without having to sell her body. I then told Guy about my situation, and he laughed too. Karma is such a bitch, right? He said. And we laughed again. Guy said he opened a numbered account and gave me the details to access the funds. He also gave me a folder with instructions on how to set up the translations. Finally, he said that I should open two separate bank accounts in my name and Carol's name in different UK banks, and he would transfer 9000 to each of them so that we could enjoy the money immediately. I thanked him and said I would contact him. When I told Carol about this, she almost fainted I had to bring her a glass of water. We arrived in London with one suitcase between us, so as not to exceed the allowed luggage weight. We returned with four rolling suitcases, not caring about the overweight surcharge. When we returned home, we each had at least a dozen gifts, which they unwrapped to the joyful screams of the children. Over the next year, we moved to a better area and bought a bigger house with a pool. When people asked where we got the money, I said that my uncle, whom I never knew, died and left me a fortune since he had no other relatives. This satisfied everyone. I paid off Mike and Linda's mortgage and began gradually putting small amounts into the bank as I had been advised. We both continued to work because we thought we would be bored sitting at home and spent little except on exotic vacations with the kids. One day, while looking through my finances, I was amazed. Even though I had spent quite large sums, not only had I not reduced my principal, but I had not even managed to spend the interest. Sometimes I would remember that vacation with Alex and get angry. It wasn't that she left me, I was okay with that. I was angry that another man had taken her away from me. He has done this many times to other couples and has ruined many lives. It occurred to me that I had no way of doing anything about it before he was out of my reach and I couldn't touch him. I decided that I wanted to get revenge for all the lives he had ruined and came up with a plan for revenge. As an engineer, I'm used to solving problems, so I made a list of what I needed to do. 1. Find him. 2. Decide what kind of revenge is right for him. 3. Find help to carry out my revenge. 4. Do everything through a third party. 5. He must not find out that I am taking revenge on him, otherwise he will come after me with all his money. 1. It was easy. I hired a private investigator in the Bahamas to find him. I gave him the name of his yacht and told him I wanted to know when he was coming back to the Bahamas. The detective said it would be easy as a yacht of that size would have to be equipped with a tracker. I said I wanted to know as soon as he headed towards the Bahamas. 2. Revenge had to fit the crime. I thought about it for a long time, and in the end I decided that she should stop him from hunting other couples but should not be violent, I did not want the law to interfere with this. Finally, I came up with the perfect solution. I told Carol that I needed my dignity back and that I was going to get revenge on Jules. She wasn't too happy, but she said she understood and asked me not to do anything that could harm me. I agreed, and she calmed down. I booked a room at the same hotel we stayed at on that same Bahamas vacation. Three and four. I was going to go to the more seedy parts of the city, so I hired Max's bodyguard. When I told him I wanted to meet the owner of the brothel, 
He asked why, and I told him the truth. He burst out laughing and nearly knocked me over by slapping me on the back. He said he knew the right person, and we went there. His name was Jose, and after I explained what I needed, he said he had the right girl. We all met and discussed the details and price. It would have cost me a lot of million, but it was worth it. Jose wanted everything in advance, but I said, no, first in advance, and the rest after completion. 5. I wasn't going to be around when everything happened. In fact, he was not supposed to find out that he had been deceived until he reached Europe. Now all I could do was wait. I received the same call. Jules is heading back to the USA. I made several calls and started a chain of actions to carry out my revenge. Jules Gaudier sat at his usual table, looking around at the arriving customers in search of a suitable match for his perverted game. While he was waiting, a man and a woman approached the table, and everything played out as if according to a well-practiced script. The maitre de hotel looked at Jules, who nodded. The maitre de hotel then made a show of saying that they did not have a free table for the couple. The man looked upset and the woman looked angry. Jules got exactly what he expected. He intervened and saved the situation. The hook was abandoned. Three days later, the woman was already sailing on Jules' yacht. He won again. When they arrived in Europe, Jules went ashore alone, leaving the woman on the yacht. She left all her things in the cabin and also went ashore, telling the crew that she needed to buy something for herself. She left and never returned. The man was waiting for her with another passport, and they took off on a plane before Jules returned. When he returned, there was a letter on her bed. Letter. Dear Jules, you're probably wondering where your date is. Answer. Very, very far. What is this about? I'll tell you. A few years ago, I took my wife on vacation, and you stole her from me by pretending to be a friend. This is my revenge. You couldn't resist Elena, and when she walked into a restaurant with someone who wasn't her husband, you immediately struck. But this time you were wrong and fell into my trap. I hope you enjoyed having sex with Elena because she left you a little gift in the form of a virus. So enjoy it. I hope you die in agony, you pathetic piece of shit. All the worst. Rob. I received a message on my burner phone saying, Mission accomplished, and made a call to transfer the remaining money to the numbered account. Revenge is complete. I felt like a weight had been lifted from me. Finally, I regained my dignity and felt like a whole person again. The next two years passed peacefully in the Price household. We were the perfect family. Samantha started dating, I really didn't like it, and I wanted to scare her boyfriend, but Carol talked to her and assured me that everything would be okay. Carl was now 13, and he began to break boundaries, as boys do at that age. I coped by taking him hiking, fishing, and other outdoor activities, sometimes inviting one of his friends along. He was crazy about football and played on the school team. Samantha was a cheerleader and star of the drama club, starring in various productions at her school. Life was wonderful, and then this happened. James called me and told me that Alex was back in town and wanted to see me. Alex. When I arrived in Malibu, I went straight to my house a gift from an oil tycoon, but I couldn't get inside because my code no longer worked. I called the real estate office that was monitoring the house, and they told me that the code changes every month and I need to come to their office to confirm my identity. It was almost six o'clock in the evening and they were about to close for the night, so I called a taxi to the nearest hotel and booked a room for the night. The next morning I went to the real estate office and received a new code. When I walked into the house, I noticed how big it was and couldn't help but think how great it would be if our family lived here. But my thoughts quickly ended Rob would never agree to live in a house bought with money earned by my body. But I had to see him and the children I left five years ago. But will he want to see me? I could claim that I could provide a better future for the children and threaten to take them away if he didn't want to listen to me. I desperately wanted my old life back and was willing to do anything to get it. I spent the next few months wandering around my huge house. It was not a home, just a place to sleep. I decided to take a road trip back to Iowa. I was going to drive my Lamborghini 2000 miles home. I thought it would take me about a week. 
The first thing I learned about my Lambo is that it has a very small trunk. I had to put my suitcases in the small back seat. Two days into the trip, my back started to hurt. The Lambo was great for short trips, but long trips were clearly not for it. I exchanged it for a BMW X5, a much more comfortable car. Even so, I quickly got tired and wondered how long distance truck drivers managed to stay awake. Almost three weeks later, including a three-day stay at a luxury hotel where I was pampered, I finally made it there. The first night, I was sitting at dinner when a handsome man approached me and asked if he could have a seat. Previously, I would have happily agreed, but not now. I politely said that I was waiting for my boyfriend, and he left. I didn't want to see any more men, except maybe Rob. When I got into town, I booked a room at the Sherrington Hotel. I took a suite to have more space to walk around. That night, I made plans to return to my family's life. The first thing after breakfast, I went to our old house. I was sure they were still living there, since Rob probably still couldn't afford to move. I was going to dazzle them with my wealth and make their dreams come true. When I arrived, there was no car near the house, so I thought that Rob's car was probably in the garage. It was Saturday morning, and he wasn't supposed to be at work. I rang the doorbell, and a middle-aged woman in a dressing gown appeared on the threshold. Hello, how can I help you? Does Rob Price live here? No, they moved about three years ago. Are you, by any chance, Alex? Yes, how do you know? Mr. Price said you might show up sometime and left a note for you. Wait here, I'll bring it now. She returned with a sealed envelope and handed it to me, then closed the door. I returned to my car and read the note. Note. Alex, if you are reading this, then you know that we have moved. Please don't try to find us. You won't be able to say anything we'd be interested in hearing. If you need to discuss legal matters, my lawyer's business card is included. I sat there stunned. Rob had moved on, and he didn't want me. Well, I shouldn't have been surprised. I abandoned him and the children. The paper became wet, and then I realized that I was crying. I knew Rob's lawyer, James, and his wife Helen, and knew where they lived, so I went to see them. I rang the doorbell and Helen answered. When she saw me, her face turned red. What do you want here? A voice came from the depths of the house. Helen, who's there? It's Jane's wife who's a wuss. What should I tell her? Opening hours are from nine to five. Let him make an appointment. You heard him. Now get lost. And just like that, they just turned me away. Then I went to my parents, hoping that they would help me find out Rob's new address. I rang the doorbell and waited. Just a minute. I heard my mother's voice and my heart jumped finally, someone who would forgive me. The door opened and Mom just stood there, looking at me with her mouth open. I smiled and asked, Will you let your daughter in? She looked me up and down as if I were a tramp begging, and then she broke my heart. We don't have a daughter. She died five years ago. From the depths of the house, the father's voice was heard. Who is this? Nobody. And she closed the door. I stood there with tears streaming down my face. This couldn't be real. My parents disowned me. I got into the car and just drove without a goal. An hour or so later, I found myself outside the city and saw a small gas station on the right, so I turned off. There was a cafe at the gas station, and I suddenly felt hungry. I hadn't eaten since breakfast, and it was already three o'clock in the afternoon. I gassed up the car and went inside, operating on autopilot. I sat down at a table, and a middle-aged waitress came up to me with a menu. I don't remember what I ordered, but while I was sitting and eating, drinking coffee, I began to shake and sob. The waitress, Cindy, came over and asked if I wanted to be alone. I simply nodded, and she took me to the backyard, where it turned out to be her apartment. She sat me down and brought me some water, asking if I wanted to talk. I looked at her at her friendly face, and everything spilled out. She didn't say a word until I finished. Honey, from what you said, I see that you made very bad decisions, and now you are paying for them. I don't know why you did what you did, but I see that now you regret it. I see that you need to close this issue, but things will get a lot worse before they get better. 
You need to apologize to everyone and then move on they already did. Do you know how I know this? I myself once made a lot of bad choices, got into bad company, and took illegal substances. Later I went to therapy and my therapist told me the same thing I told you. I did as he advised, and now I can live with myself, but I had to let my husband move on with his life. He is now married to someone else, but they still allow me to see our daughter whenever I want. I've been clean for two years now and intend to stay that way. You need to make peace with everyone you hurt and move on. Now, I'm not a professional, but if you want to talk again, you know where to find me. I returned to the hotel feeling a little better and decided to take her advice. On Monday, I made an appointment with James for the same day. They took me in right away. Before I could say anything, he raised his hand. Alex, I know what you want, but I can't help you. I called Rob and told him you wanted to see him, but he asked me not to give you his address. However, the children are still minors and you have the right to see them. Rob agreed, albeit reluctantly, so I'm going to set up a meeting with a court-appointed consultant. If all goes well, you may be eligible for visitation, but don't get your hopes up too high. Where are you staying now so I can contact you? And it would be nice if you hired a lawyer. Personally, as a former friend, I have to ask, what were you even thinking about? I sat there, digesting what he said. I was going to see my children, but not the man I still loved. I agreed to his proposal and got ready to leave. I thought that Rob must still live nearby and decided that I would find a house nearby. It should be big enough for the children to stay with me if all goes well. I looked up at James and realized he had asked me a question, and all I could say was, What? What did you say? He repeated his question, and I blurted out everything that had accumulated. When I finished, he looked at me like I was worse than dirt. Well, now it's clear why you didn't try to call anyone, but it's not clear why you left. When you did this, you burned many bridges and you had no friends left in this city. Oh, and one more thing, the court ruled that you must return to your maiden name. I left the office feeling more optimistic about my chances of being reunited with my family. The next day I went looking for a house with hope in my heart. I found a nice four-bedroom house in a gated community in a good area. I started arranging it and decided that I would let the children choose furniture for their rooms if everything went according to plan. I hired a lawyer as recommended, and he told me not to get my hopes up since I had clearly abandoned my family. I moved into a new house a week later and told James my new address. A few days later, my lawyer called me. A child welfare officer would be coming at 11 o'clock on Saturday morning with my children for a short meeting. If all goes well, the court will set a meeting schedule. I was delighted that everything was finally starting to go as it should. Saturday morning, I was a nervous wreck waiting for the doorbell to ring. It sounded exactly at 11 o'clock. I rushed to open the door and saw a pleasant-looking woman and two gloomy children. I invited them inside and offered them drinks which everyone refused. The social worker introduced me to my children, and then Samantha spoke first. We know who she is and what she did. Even though Dad says she still loves us, we remember the day he came home alone. He cried a lot, but always made sure we were happy and never said anything bad about her. We know we have to be here the court ordered it, and Dad forced us, but that doesn't mean we like it. Dad said the visit would last an hour, and we've been here for five minutes, so we still have 55 left. What do you expect from us? Why should we rush into your arms? Forget it, we stopped loving you a long time ago, so stop pretending and let us go home to someone who loves us more than himself. The social worker and I were taken aback by her outburst, and then the social worker spoke to Samantha. Samantha, I know you don't want to be here, but your dad asked you to behave and that was completely rude. The court said it's an hour, so you'll stay here for an hour, understand? Samantha and Carl went and sat on the sofa, obviously sulking. I asked them about school and other activities, but received only short answers or grumbling. Things were not going at all the way I had hoped, and I had no idea how to change things. Samantha kept glancing at her watch and finally announced that the time was up and they wanted to leave. Sarah, the social worker, 
looked at me sadly and nodded that it was time to finish. When they were about to leave, I remembered that I had gifts for each of them, and I went to get them. When I handed them the gifts, Samantha looked at me. We are not like you. You cannot buy us with gifts or money. They both threw their gifts on the sofa and left. Sarah saw my tears and said that with time everything would get better she had seen this before. Then she added in a whisper, Maybe it will help if you get a puppy. Rob. James called me and said Alex wanted to see the kids. I was against it, but he said she could get a restraining order, so I asked him to try to limit their contact with her mother, which he did, also telling me her version of why she had been gone for so long. I felt a little sorry for her, but it was her fault. She arranged all this herself, so that's her problem. I explained to the children that they would have to see their mother. They said in unison, Carol is our mother, not her. She may have given birth to us, but she betrayed us long ago. I couldn't argue with their logic, so I remained silent. There were a lot of tears on the day of the meeting, and Sarah had to literally tear them away from Carol when it was time to go. I told them this was their birth mother, so be polite, and I'll see you later. When they returned, Sarah explained what had happened, but advised them to continue meeting regardless. I didn't like them seeing Alex, but there was nothing I could do about it unless she did something wrong. The same scene repeated itself over the next six months. Alex even tried to win them over by buying a puppy. All she achieved was that the children now wanted to get a puppy. I talked them into adopting a teenage dog from a shelter. It was a mixed breed dog, but mostly a Labrador. She quickly became part of the family, and we all loved her. Her name was Megan. Alex. I tried everything to connect with Samantha and Carl, but nothing worked. I even bought a puppy, a purebred beagle named Tom. They obviously liked it and played with it during visits, but continued to ignore me. After six months Sarah said I was beating a dead horse, and these visits were only making me and the kids sad. She advised me to refuse the court order, perhaps the children themselves will come to me over time when they grow up. I was lonely. No one I knew before even wanted to communicate with me. Of course, men approached me almost every day, but the last thing I wanted was to get into a relationship with someone again. I went into the cafe to see Cindy. She said I needed to unwind and took me to a country club. She wasn't interested in men either, although she didn't like men she had problems after she was kicked out onto the street when she was an addict. We became good friends, and one day I invited her over for dinner. Tom was delighted with her, and she played with him while I prepared dinner. We repeated this several times, and I learned to dance the Lindy Hop at the club. The house seemed empty when she was gone. Tom was good company, but the one-sided conversation wasn't much fun. After much consideration, I invited Cindy to move in with me without obligation. She was hesitant at first, but agreed on the condition that she would share the costs. I agreed, and we moved into the house together. Since I had no intention of leaving the area, I sold my house in Malibu and put the money in the bank. Cindy continued to work in the cafe. I suggested she quit because I had more money than I needed, but she wanted to pay her share. I saw that her work was exhausting her, and I was afraid that she might return to her addiction again. With these thoughts in mind, I turned to the realtor and asked him to find suitable premises for a country-style restaurant with a dance floor. It took several months, but they eventually found the right location in another part of the city. I took Cindy with me to evaluate it and asked for her opinion. She looked at everything carefully and made some suggestions about the dance floor, and I bought it. When I told her I bought the place, she asked if I had experience running a restaurant. I said that I don't have it, but I have a person who does. When she asked who it was, I replied, You. She sank heavily into the nearest chair. I? Yes, you are. You have skills and I have money. Together we can do everything. What do you say? The next day she handed in her resignation and we began setting up our restaurant, hiring a cook and waitresses. It took up all of our time and kept me from dwelling on the past or worrying about Cindy. We made a big event out of the opening night and sent out invitations. It was an invitation-only evening. I made sure Rob received his invitation and was pretty sure he would come. 
Rob. I was thrilled when Sarah said that Alex had stopped trying to work things out with the kids. After that, everything calmed down, and I thought we would never hear from Alex again. Months passed, and I almost forgot that it existed, when suddenly one day an invitation came in the mail to the opening of a new restaurant in another part of the city. I asked Carol if she wanted to go, and she happily agreed we both loved country music and dancing, so we asked Alex's parents to take the kids until Sunday. Both they and the children were happy, the grandparents because they loved spending time with the children, and the children because they were spoiled there. We got home early on Friday to get ready for the big night. I put on cowboy boots, a plaid shirt, and new jeans. Carol wore matching boots, a tied front Mustang shirt, and Daisy Duke-inspired shorts. When we arrived, we were shown to our table near the dance floor and given menus. The menu consisted of mostly country-style dishes with a few vegetarian options. The dinner was great, and while we were drinking beer, from a bottle of course, the orchestra started playing a tune. We, without hesitation, were the first to hit the dance floor, and soon it was full. We danced about five dances and then returned to the table to rest. As the evening came to an end and the slow dancing began, we were watching the dancers when suddenly someone sat down at our table. I looked back, about to tell them to move, but I saw that it was Alex. She probably noticed my angry look and spoke. Rob, please don't leave because of me. I just want to say a few words, and then I'll leave you alone forever, I promise. I almost got up from the chair, but Carol put her hand on my shoulder. Rob, nothing will happen if you listen to her. If you still don't feel comfortable, we can leave. I sat back down, glaring at Alex. Okay, say what you want, and then leave. And one more thing, how did you know that we would be here? To answer your question, this place belongs to me and my friend. As for what I want to say, it won't take long. Regardless, I want to apologize for my past actions. I was a selfish bitch, thinking I could have it all, and then come back to you and somehow make amends. Well, not everything went according to plan. Surely James told you what happened to me, and I probably deserved it. You may not believe me, but I have changed that selfish woman is no longer there. I understand that you don't care, but I needed to clear things up between us. Both you and the children have moved on and now love your new wife. Carol, I am grateful to you for taking care of the family I left behind. Please love Rob as much as I now realize I did. It's probably true that we don't appreciate what we have until we lose it. Now I'll leave you alone to enjoy the rest of your evening. Oh, and in case you ever need anything, here's my business card. One more thing. I intend to keep an eye on the kids. I won't be obvious, and they won't see me, but I will try to attend as many of their events as possible. I know you can get a restraining order to stop me, but please, I beg you, let me at least do this. Then she just left. We didn't say a word. We stayed until closing and had a great time. We didn't see her again that evening, and for a long time after that too. Whenever we went to children's activities, we would look for her and sometimes notice a lone figure standing in the distance. Or at performances where Samantha played, they saw a woman in disguise sitting in the back rows next to another woman with a video camera. One evening, there was a knock on the door. When I looked through the peephole, a woman I didn't know was standing on the threshold. I opened the door with a chain. How can I help? Hi, my name is Cindy. I'm Alex's partner at the restaurant. Can I come in? I opened the door and invited her to enter. Carol invited her to sit on the sofa and asked if she would like coffee. She agreed. So, how can we help you? First of all, Alex doesn't know I'm here, and I don't want her to find out. Alex and I live together as friends. She then told us her and Alex's life stories and how they met. We listened carefully, asked questions when necessary, and then she continued. Alex never misses an opportunity to see children, usually from afar and sometimes closer, but in disguise. When she returns home, she cries into her pillow, regretting what she lost. I can tell you from personal experience that she is not the same woman who treated you so cruelly. She has changed. Like I said, I'm not without sin, and Alex gave me a second chance, and I'm not going to let her down. 
I can't thank her with money, but I hope you'll consider giving her more time with the kids. Cindy, we don't forbid her to see the children, she tried, but they just don't want to make contact. To them, she is just the one who cheated on their father and abandoned them. We both tried to talk them down, but they got upset and ran to their rooms. Are they at home now? Yes, they are in their rooms. And what? I'd like to talk to them. Carol and I exchanged glances and shrugged. Carol went upstairs and talked with them for about ten minutes. When she returned, she said that they agreed to talk to Cindy, but only with Carol present. We agreed, and I went out with a beer and sat by the pool. About half an hour later, I heard Cindy drive away, and Carol came out and sat next to me. Rob, the reason they don't want to see their mother is because they think it will betray you. We've come to an agreement. With your permission, the next time we have a barbecue, we thought we'd invite Cindy and Alex over and see how it goes. The children will feel more relaxed with us around, and their rooms will be upstairs. What do you think? As you know, I tried to get them to see Alex, so I have no objections. But if she starts acting like old Alex, she'll leave, okay? Alex. I opened my email and was shocked to receive an invitation to a barbecue at Rob's house. The text was even more surprising. Rob and Carol invite you to a barbecue at the specified address on the specified date. Please come with a friend. I showed Cindy and asked her to come with me. We had to arrive after one o'clock in the afternoon and not bring anything with us. On the day of the barbecue, I was more nervous than ever. The invitation said to dress casual, so Cindy and I wore slacks, sandals, and light sweaters. I rang the doorbell, feeling sick with anxiety, and waited for what was essentially just a few seconds. Carol opened the door, and we exchanged formal kisses in the air and a brief hug. Carol whispered in my ear, I have nothing against you. If it weren't for you, I wouldn't be as happy as I am now. So let's try to be friends. That calmed me down a bit, but then I saw Rob. We looked at each other, and I wanted to run away, but Cindy grabbed my hand. Remember, we were invited. If he didn't want to see you, you wouldn't be here. When Rob approached, I extended my hand to him, but he ignored it and hugged me, exchanging a formal kiss, as he promised, so that the children would see that he had forgiven me and that they should do the same. We were served drinks and went out to the pool. About eight children were playing in the pool, splashing loudly and laughing as they do when children are happy. We found a couple of sun loungers and sat down. Carol brought several other guests and introduced us not as Rob's ex-wife, but simply by name, mentioning that we owned a new restaurant. This immediately sparked a conversation about the restaurant and its success. I was so carried away by the conversation that I forgot about my nerves and felt relaxed and content. Until Samantha and Carl came up to me. I didn't know what to say, so I just commented on how beautiful their house was. Samantha looked at Carl and he said, Tell me, you're better at this. Samantha sighed and began to speak. Daddy said he forgave you and we should do the same. We will try, but don't expect that we will become close to you right away. First of all, Carol is our mother, so we won't call you mom. Maybe in time we'll call you Aunt Alex. I know this is not what you wanted, but this is our best offer. As for seeing us, that will be decided by mom and dad. Against our beliefs, we are willing to give you a second chance, but if you start behaving like before again, we will sever all ties forever. Well, do you agree with our terms? I sat there, feeling happy and sad at the same time. I was stripped of my title as mother and demoted to aunt, but I was ready to accept whatever I could and become the best aunt in the world. I accept your offer. I promise to go slowly and not interfere in your life unless you ask. Can I at least kiss you on the cheek to say thank you? They let me do it and then went back to play with their friends. I was in seventh heaven and couldn't stop smiling my children were part of my life again. I almost didn't notice Rob sitting down next to me. I only realized this when Cindy stood up and walked away. You should be grateful to Carol. She convinced us to give you a second chance, so don't screw it up. Rob, I'm not the same person anymore. I've learned my lesson over the past five years. 
I've changed, and I'm not going to ruin everything. Do you want us to leave? No, I have one last surprise for you, which will be here soon. A few minutes later, two people arrived and walked towards me. These were my parents. Mom spoke first. I think you know how disappointed we were in you and were ready to disown you forever. But Rob said he forgave you and we should do the same. Your father and I discussed this and decided that it was time to leave bygones in the past and welcome you back into the family. After these words, they both hugged me tightly. I have never felt so happy in my life. I had a family again. Although Alex was accepted back into the family, she was never invited back to Rob and Carol's house. She saw the children regularly, and her relationship with her daughter began to look more like a relationship with her beloved aunt. When the kids had sporting events or school plays, she was invited to sit with Rob and Carol to watch. They never became friends, but they stopped being enemies. Alex regretted her actions for the rest of her life. She continues to live with Cindy, and their restaurant is called Two Broken Women Country Stop. Subscribe to our channel so that your love doesn't cheat on you, and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think click to the next one. 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 Click to the next one.